Ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world, May is here. Spring is quickly coming to a close, and we are continuing our ongoing, groundbreaking conversation series with independent candidates from all across the country. And we have another uh, brave, courageous, independent candidate that I am very happy to have joining us on the program, the great and powerful Shalane Etchinson joins us on Independent Americans. Welcome, Shalane. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, Paul, and I appreciate you using this platform to highlight independent candidates. Well, we've been trying to do the best we can. I'm especially interested in, in elevating veteran independent candidates, and you're the first in this series that we've had. We're going to get into that. You've got an impressive background. You've got a hard fight, but you're no stranger to hard fights, uh, and we're looking forward to, to getting into that. But let me ask you, Shalane, the question I, I start with all candidates. Um, who are you and where are you and why are you running for office? I'll start with the where. I'm in North Carolina in a place called Southern Pines in Moore County. It is on the outskirts of the military base Fort Bragg. It's now called Fort Liberty. And I've been here since 2011. I was brought here because of my military service. And Fort Bragg is home to Army Special Operations, and I was a special operator. So I had the privilege of being able to stay put here during most of my military career. Um, now, who am I? I? I believe people need to use their strengths in their life to give back. What is their purpose? Where can they serve? And my strengths have been the ability to do bold things and to lead. And so that's why I'm running. I'm not afraid to do bold things and to lead. And that's indicative of what led me into the military. I do not come from a military family whatsoever. Um, my mom's Canadian, half my family's Canadian. Um, but 9-11 happened when I was in high school. It was surely a very pivotal event. And I just felt, you know, there's nagging thing that I needed to serve. Someone has to do something about it. Why not me doing the bold step? So I joined the army after college and I had a pretty incredible career, one that I was not expecting it to take me the places that it took me, but I had a pretty uh, pioneering opportunities for women in special operations. When I joined at the time, there was a ban on women in combat, and I was part of a pilot program deploying a very select few of women in combat with Army Rangers and Navy SEALs in Afghanistan. So I was part of that program. We were successful. Certainly it had its challenges, both surviving Afghanistan. I was deployed to Helmand, province, one of the most dangerous places in the world, but then also building that rapport with these male special operators who've never had women on their team before. Um, and the success of that program was used as evidence to ultimately rescind the women in combat ban. And I'm very proud of that. And I ended up staying in special operations. I assessed for a highly competitive tier one special mission unit. And, um, and so I was selected for that and able to go on subsequent deployments to uh, Syria fighting ISIS. I embedded with female Kurdish fighters and then also worked closely with intergovernmental agencies and our intelligence agencies and State Department. So I'm not afraid to do bold things and lead. And I'm really excited to be bringing those strengths of mine into the political arena and as an independent. I mean, it can't be um, overstated enough. I mean, you, you, um, what you did in the military is really groundbreaking. I mean, I, I'm, it's the evolution of the lioness teams that, you know, I saw when I was on the ground, you know, during the invasion and, and to see the path that you've uh, carved out, I think is is really historic and important. I know you were profiled in my friend Gail's book and in the New York Times and other places. Um, so I think that part of your story is is really, really important um, beyond the politics of it all. I, I think it's an incredible opportunity for you to tell the story um, of the women in your unit and this transformation happening in our military that's long overdue. But the transformation in politics is long overdue too, right? And, and you're running in a pretty tough place. Before we get to the specifics of your race in North Carolina's ninth, can you talk to me, Shalane, about why are you an independent? Some of these questions I'm going to ask you know, every candidate, and, and it's going to be interesting to hear the variety of answers. But why are you an independent, and how do you define a political independent? I, I'm an independent because I'm a free thinker. I've never been a conformist. And I think conformity is very dangerous. 
And so I take a lot of pride in being able to look at the issues for what they are and not be beholden to some label, some ideology that I have to think this way or have to think this way. And so I actually believe, well, and the stats show, most Americans are independent. We need independent free thinkers in all facets, facets of our society and especially our political arena. So being an independent is a no brainer to me, free thinker and, um, and, and can, can make decisions for myself, not because a party tells me what to do. And a really hard path, right? So let's talk about the race you're running in. You know, you're running against Richard Hudson, uh, who's an incumbent. Uh, who won, I think, with, you know, 83 percent in the last uh, election. He's a Republican. You know, he's not a moderate by any means. I mean, he's a pretty far right Republican. Um, there's a Democrat in the race, too, um, Nigel Barstow. But he's seems to be hardly even registering with about, you know, six thousand dollars in donations. So this seems like a district that's been a Republican stronghold. Uh, talk about your uh, assessment of the race. You're, you're a military strategist now. You're a political strategist. Talk about um, how you think you can win. How can how are you going to take on Hudson? How are you going to take on these deeply entrenched, mostly uh, Republican in, in your district um, forces? And, and how do you see a path to victory? Mm -hmm. Well, you hit it on the head. This district is not a competitive district. A Democrat has not won. A Democrat will not win. Um, it does lean Republican and Last November, the North Carolina General Assembly redid the maps, redistricting, and gerrymandered it so much more that it really is there an impossible pathway to win as a Democrat. And uh, and so to me, that thing, like, why not then give this a shot as an unaffiliated or independent candidate? And I don't care how entrenched an incumbent is. We have to have competitive elections. We have to at least try. Um, and so I reject the notion that, hey, this is an uphill battle and all the favoritism towards incumbencies. People still need to at least have choices on the ballot. And I'm excited that they're going to have another choice. And um, and so there are certainly things that differentiate me with Richard Hudson. Fort Bragg is a huge staple of this district. OK, this is this is where this is where I went to war and back multiple times. It's the largest military base in the world by population. And there's a huge veteran constituency. I mean, I that I know that constituency intimately um, and he doesn't. And there another differentiator is um, women's reproductive rights. Uh, I'm the only woman in the race. I care about that issue. I'm pro freedom on that issue. He's not. And the Democrat, he doesn't even live in this district. So I, I'm not sure the sense behind that. I think when it comes to tit for tat, I am the most uh, compelling candidate in this race of the three. And oh, by the way, 35% of my district is registered unaffiliated. And that's on par with the Republican registrants. So I, I don't think it's a matter of them being better candidates than me per se. It's just a matter of getting the message out that there is an alternative choice for the people here and for them to be bold enough to vote differently. And I, I get there's the whole spoiler argument. And that case is true when you are in a competitive district between the Republican and Democrat. This is not a competitive district. Yeah, I think I think that this is a really fascinating race for for a number of reasons. I mean, I want to drill down on Hudson for a second because just to to give to give the contrast here. I mean, he, he's a birther. Uh, he voted against Hurricane Sandy relief. Um, he voted against the American Rescue Plan Act. He voted against the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. He voted against the PACT Act, which is the burn pit legislation that just anybody who runs who who votes against that. I just don't understand how you can call yourself a patriot especially in a place like Fort Bragg. I mean, it's mm -hmm. hard for us old schoolers to still not call it Fort Bragg. But the point is, um, you know, this is a guy that, that seems to be representing a very narrow part of any constituency, even in a place that's red like, like North Carolina's ninth. Um, talk a little bit more about that, that strategic point, if you can, Shalane. Will you seek the Democratic endorsement? This is one of those cases like Evan McMullen and others we've talked about in the past. He ran in Utah in a place where a Democrat could never win. 
Uh, he actually got the Democratic support. He said, look, if you're an independent, if you're a Democrat or you're a moderate Republican, I'm your guy. He was competitive. He didn't win. Um, but talk about your strategy in, in, in addressing the, that, that landscape. Well, on Richard Hudson's voting record, uh, it does defy logic that he would vote against those things, especially when it comes to veterans issues. He'll be the first one to say he's very proud to be Fort Bragg's congressman. Well, with all due respect, he wasn't in Ramadi like I was breathing in that burn pit smoke. He wasn't in Helmand, Afghanistan, breathing in that toxins. He doesn't go to the VA healthcare center like I do. And so I certainly can relate to the veterans here and would have voted differently than him on, on that regard. Um, now, I would think that the Democrats, if they are intent on unseating a Republican here, and let me be clear, I'm not a Democrat. I am doing this as an unaffiliated candidate. But there is some alignment, right? Um, I am not right of Richard Hudson. I am a proud centrist. And I'm proud to be running on some uh, democratic platforms that are important to them, like pro-choice. And I'm really proud to be a pro-democracy candidate as well. And I know the Democrats um, um, really are running on that. So we'll you know, we'll see how that shakes out. Um, I think that it would be, again, in their best interest to endorse someone like me and understand that, you know, unfortunately, there just isn't a pathway for a Democrat victory here. But there might be for a centrist, moderate candidate like me with my background in this particular district. Yeah, I, re I really do think your your case is one of those is real, you know, gut check moments for a community and for the country. Um, I mean, in, in my view, it should be everybody against us. I mean, I don't care if you're a Democrat, an independent, Green Party, whatever. I mean, this is a guy who's a, a lifetime politician. He's not a veteran. I mean, this seems like a pretty stark contrast. But one of your tactical challenges was you had, was you had to get on the ballot, right? Now you've gotten enough signatures. You're on the ballot. Um, I haven't seen any polling. Maybe now that you're on the ballot, some of the local papers or universities will do polling. I think that's a challenge for many independents is to just get some basic polling to show the contrast between you and the incumbent. Um, but can you talk about what you had to do to get on the ballot um, and, and how you see that impacting the next couple of weeks, especially because this just happened in the last month or so? That's right. Uh, you know, the petition process was certainly an arduous task. And when I decided to get in this race, I didn't know if we would be successful or not. But there's one thing I have, and it's grit. It's grit. And I thought, you know what, we are going to give this our all. And I, I will die before we don't get this done. Um, and so it was and we did not have the luxury of a lot of time. The deadline to get the petition done was March 5th. And we started in earnest around mid, mid to late January. So we had about seven weeks. Um, mind you, this has also never been successfully done before in the state of North Carolina at the congressional level. OK, so um, the petition, it was a combination of some paid canvassers that I had and then also volunteers. And thank God my community here is a bunch of military veterans that know how to put together an operation and won't quit because we had people every day at a post office, a library, a street corner, their own groups getting signatures for the cause. And every single day I was out there, be it gas stations, rain or shine, and this is January, February, those are sleepy months, colder weather, but um, that was my duty to go and get signatures. And I'm so thankful that we did that because it meant that every day I was talking to regular voters here in this district. And I was hearing their concerns and also anecdotally getting their reaction to having an independent candidate option. And overall, it was very well received. The electorate is so tired of what they are getting. And so uh, we were successful. We got the minimum signatures we needed. In fact, we exceeded it by quite amount. We just got shy of 12,800 signatures for this petition. So I am so proud of the work that we put in to make sure that that was a success. And I'll tell you what, neither one of my opponents had to do that, nor did they yeah. have a primary. So I liked it. I've actually done more of a ground game than they have. I think that that's the long-term, you know, movement building stuff. Cause you know, even if you don't win this race, I hope you're going to be, you know, in the movement out in front for a long time. You'd be a very viable statewide candidate. 
Um, you know, I know you're going to continue to lift up others. You know, we've had this series going on. We had Jared Young on last week. We had Yemi Mobilati, who's, I think, a real success story a couple weeks ago. Part of what we're trying to do with this show is kind of combine forces. Um, but there's still, you know, the, the fundraising challenge, um, you know, the, the media challenge that Jared's talked about. But there's also the national challenge where you've got to try to identify what you are as an independent versus people like uh, RFK Jr., Cornell West, Jill Stein, even going back to Ross Perot and uh, Jesse Ventura. So this is a time to kind of redefine independence, but the national race is going to be what sucks up the most oxygen. So a question I'm going to ask everybody, are you going to endorse anybody for president? Will you endorse any of the independent candidates, the Republican, the Democrat, or anyone else? What are you planning to do? No, I will not be endorsing anyone for presidency. And I, you know, I have a problem with that because then that implies that they are somehow a proxy for who I am and what I care about and how I lead and make decisions. And, and I am my own independent person and I want people to judge me based off my message, my merit, not who I may or may not endorse for the presidency. Are you going to share who you're going to vote for before you do? I don't think so. I, and it's, this is, this is the problem. 70% uh, of Americans are unhappy with the two primary candidate nominees. And it's pitting people in these very, very extreme siloed buckets. And I, I just reject that notion. I do. We are more complex than Biden and Trump. And, and, uh, and so I, I, again, they're not a proxy for who I am. Um, and, and nor do I want to be negatively judged based off whatever, who, whatever decision I come up with to vote for, nor am I doing that for other people because they feel like they're be giving, they're giving impossible choices and I'm not going to yeah, judge. But I'm going to press you on it. Like I press Jared and, and I'll press anyone else on this. I mean, th that to me, right. That, that makes it sound like you think Trump and Biden are equal. And I think for a lot of people, they're going to want to know, hey, this person for Congress is ultimately going to have to choose, right? You're going to have to make tough decisions on issues of war and peace. Um, so, so when you look at Biden and Trump, do you really view them as equals? Um, or, you know, how, how, do, how do we put you on a spectrum and people who are evaluating the commander in chief as, uh, yeah, we have nobody's happy with either. A lot of people are not happy with either one of them. But, but most people are going to have pick someone. Uh, I assume you're still going to vote for someone for president. So how do you square that circle? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I need to look at what are the issues that are important to me and protecting our democracy and preserving that is key. We are the longest running democracy in history. I don't want it to end anytime soon. So whatever candidate showcases that they are most serious about that. Okay. And then do you, same think that's thing, still TB, do, you, do you think that's still TBD? Do you feel like Trump is interested in protecting democracy right now in the same way that Joe Biden is? He hasn't demonstrated a real concern for that. Yeah. Compared to other candidates. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. So, so, so for folks who, who are waiting to see, you're just going to take that position all the way to the end. You're not going to tell folks who you're voting for. You're not going to uh, endorse a candidate and you're going to have to just try to figure out where you sit on the spectrum based off your 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 statements and your um your campaign alone. Yeah, well again, I think it's important that people evaluate me for me and 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 not make these judgments or that the presidency is some sort of pr a proxy for me. Um but we'll see how the race goes on. You know, I'm still introducing myself to people. And so once they're introduced to Shalane Etchison as the candidate and there is trust and understanding built first and then we can have good faith conversations we can talk more about uh the presidency and who who i may be casting my vote for or not I'm caucusing because that you know this congressional uh situation could be close enough that your race you know theoretically determines who controls the house right there was a special election in new york democrats took that you know shrunk the margin uh of majority for the gop so if you're in the house and you're elected to serve from the north carolina uh, ninth, are you who are you going to caucus with or are you going to caucus with no one? Well, that's another one of those questions where it's like, I know you're an independent, but like, who are you really? 
And, and that's just kind of how the house is set up right now. And so it's a fair question because we are disruptors. We are pushing the envelope and doing something different. I would be honored to be the token independent. And I know there's a couple of congressional independent candidates here. So hopefully we can get a couple of us in there. I would be honored to be in that position um, and to have that bargaining power and that leverage. And, you know, I view this as... I, caucus with this per the, with this group or this group it doesn't mean it's a reliable vote for their platforms or what they're pushing i want to make that blatantly clear um i will certainly have to weigh which uh which caucus would be most impactful for contributing to my constituents here in north carolina right i'm working for them where can i have the most impact in getting legislation passed for the people here in the ninth district. So that's something that I would consider. And then again, what are the issues that are important to me? Who is putting the preservation of our democracy on the forefront of, of what they're pushing? That's a consideration. And then again, the uh, the pro-choice as well. We're, you know, we're all gonna root for you, but I've asked this to other folks too. The, the odds are you won't win, right? I mean, we're all rooting for you. We wanna push for you. What, what's your plan if you don't win? Are you gonna run again? Are you going to go, uh, you, you, you went to Harvard, you could do a lot of other things. Um, what's your plan if, if you don't win this race? So I have, I don't like operating off of a plan B mindset. And that's not what I have going into this. I wake up every day and visualize winning on November 5th, because that's what I believe the people deserve. And that is what I am committing myself to for this year. And that's exactly how I've accomplished what I've accomplished in the military. I have gone through arduous selection processes in the highest echelons of special operations units where very few make it because the mindset is no fail. Okay. Um, and when I applied to graduate school, I only applied to one school. Harvard, because that was no fail. Okay. So I don't really like to operate off of plan B mindsets. It's a distraction. I'm focused on winning November 5th, full stop. I, I appreciate the perspective, but just to give folks a sense of what you're up against, your opponents raised two and a half million bucks, right? Um, have you had uh, any public filings or can you share what you all have raised so far and what you think you need to raise to be competitive? Yeah, certainly that's, that is one of the barriers for good people entering the political arena is the sheer cost of money that it is to run a competitive race. That's unfortunate. I think there needs to be more reforms because it's preventing good people from getting in. Um, you know, I'm doing this as an independent. You have to be more entrepreneurial with how you go about your campaign. And that's the same way that I'm looking at how to fund my campaign. Sure, I'm reaching out to the traditional donor class and some of them get it and want to help because again, they have a vested interest in perhaps unseating the incumbent and we have a you know mutual interest there. But I'm reaching out to people that are uh, not the traditional donor class, everyday Americans who want to see different candidates breaking through the noise and willing to support me. I'm reaching out to people who are business leaders that like to disrupt things. Think Silicon Valley, startup types. You have to disrupt to evolve. And so uh, I'm making my pitch and my case to a myriad of people uh, for their support in this endeavor. Got it. Well, I'm going to, you're going to generously stick around for our Patreon members who are some of our most dedicated folks. We'll ask you a couple uh, special questions there on the extended content for our Patreon members only. But let me ask you a final question, um, Shalane. First of all, thank you for doing this. Thank you for stepping up to lead. Um, I'll give you 30 seconds or a minute. You know, the floor is yours to independent Americans around the country, uh, not just in North Carolina, because I think this is really about a national movement. Why should they support you this year? Yeah, it is a national movement. And I just want to remind all the independents out there, we are the plurality. We are the majority. We all know the system's broken and that we need something different. And so my message is that we need to start be brave and be willing to cast our votes differently. That's the power of our democracy and a participatory democracy. What we do in the ballot box and then how we're willing to support candidates. Obviously having the requisite resources 
is important. It's key. And so my charge would be if you don't have an independent candidate in your in your particular races or districts of where you are, um, be willing to support people like myself or other guests that you've had on the show in our endeavor, because it's a movement. It is. And change happens incrementally, but we have to be brave and willing to step up and make that change happen. Think about where our country would be right now if we didn't have people willing to Take that bold step, do something disruptive, and move the ball down the field for the greater good. So um, there's plenty of ways to support independent candidates, and uh, and it's an exciting time. And I think we need to do it unapologetically as well, because we're the majority. We can't forget that. Well, you've got my support. Um, you know, I've, I haven't been shy about doing personal endorsements of the folks that I think are really representing the movement well. I think the, you know what you're up against is tremendous. Um, but you're no stranger to big challenges. And I think it's especially important for veteran independent candidates to be elevated um, as a part of the narrative, the national narrative that's happening. I mean, this is not just a one year fight. It's a generational fight and a generational movement. And I think that you, Shalane, are going to be a part of that, a key part of that uh, leadership in the movement for a long time. So thank you for your courage. You know, thank you for your leadership in uniform and outside of uniform. I know this is just the start of what will be a career of service and inspiration. So thank you for all you're doing. Folks can check out more about Shalane's campaign in the show notes. I encourage you uh, to volunteer, donate, support in whatever way you can, especially if you're in North Carolina. But even if you're not, uh, Shalane Etchinson, thank you so much. We wish you the best of luck and stay vigilant. Thank you so much, Paul. It was great.